Our favorite tool for entrepreneurs podcast will address tools that are useful to startups and existing businesses. We will also cover other aspects of the launch and growth of entrepreneurial ventures. Your two hosts will be Professor Gary Palin and serial entrepreneur Ryan Budden. I'm Professor Gary Palin. Yeah, and I'm Ryan Budden. This podcast is valuable to entrepreneurs in both launch and growth modes. That's absolutely right. We'll go over some tools, get you into hyper growth mode. How can we see some hockey stick growth in your business? Well, welcome, Dr. Patricia Griffin. It's a pleasure to have you join us. And our topic today is professional selling. Uh, you have a litany of experience in professional selling as a practitioner, uh, as a sales manager, and also more recently as a uh, professor, where you focus very specifically on certain courses on professional selling. Uh, as a matter of fact, you, you've been a colleague of mine for about six years, and the students speak extremely highly of your ability to teach professional selling. Just through knowing Professor Palin, I've heard very highly about you. So I'm really excited to have you on today and, and hear a little bit about what you have to say. Why don't you give us just kind of a brief overview of what professional selling is? Well, thank you to both of you for those kind words. Um, you know, I was in sales for many, many years and wasn't aware of the fact that its roots go all the way back to ancient Greece where they literally found ancient writings that talked about an exchange between people, which is essentially what personal selling is. Even Plato in his writings had salesmen in there. So it, from those humble beginnings until now, it's gone through kind of a rocky path. Um, England in the Industrial Revolution had lots of salespeople. And unfortunately, we it could be why we have this negative perception of salespeople to this day, because a lot of the techniques were underhanded. They used manipulation and uh, they lied. And so unfortunately, sometimes we just can't shake that, that perception. But, but sales continued on through the late Middle Ages, where we had door-to-door -door peddlers. And then in the post-industrial revolution, we started to see sales really start to expand in the United States. And even in 1850, there, there's recordings of a company in Detroit that sent 400 salespeople out to sell their product. So again, it's nothing new, but it has changed over, the time, over time. And in 1912, Charles Hoyt published the first text on sales management. And he even started to see this change from the order taker, the transaction-based salesperson to a salesperson who was really focused on trust. And even um, in, 19, in the 1940s, professionalism in sales started to become even more um, uh, public and more uh, publicized, more, more popular. And I, I think we can give a lot of credit to Harvard Business Review. In 1947, they published an article asking salespeople to be more professional. And what does that mean? It just means that salespeople were becoming more customer oriented. They were being more truthful. Um, they weren't manipulating customers as they had in the past. And so we bring it up to today where we see that salespeople aren't order takers anymore but it encompasses a variety of skills from um, you know, spending time being a problem solver, being a consultant with your customers, focusing on long-term relationships as opposed to just taking the order and then going to the next customer. And now we see organizations like Microsoft with almost 20,000 salespeople. American Express has almost 25,000 salespeople. PepsiCo, almost 40,000 salespeople. And the estimates are that more than 10% of the American workforce is in sales in one form or another. That's a fascinating history. Uh, Ryan, I assume you're taking notes because Dr. Griffin's going to give a quiz at the end of this discussion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some serious <laughs> history put in there. So I, I, I hopefully we're recording this. <laughs> I really appreciate the, the transition and moving more towards a professional selling and the specific knowledge and skills associated with professional selling. In today's environment, specifically in the entrepreneurial environment, what can you do with that, those uh, the skills and knowledge? I 
believe in it's not just a personal opinion, but the uh, research that's coming out is showing that we are constantly trying to change other people's behavior. We're constantly trying to persuade people to come to our side. And so most people aren't aware of the fact that we're constantly selling ourselves, whether you're an entrepreneur starting out and you're trying to sell your product to a parent who's trying to persuade their child to eat their vegetables to consultants who are trying to gain new business. I mean, there's a realm of possibilities for anybody who is trying to understand professional and personal selling. I really like that. I think a lot of the time in entrepreneurship, especially early stage entrepreneurship, there's a huge blend between the salesperson and the customer service person. So where do you see that crossover and where's, where's the demarcation line? I think you have to be everything to everybody. The key is to be successful. You need to understand what resonates with the person that you're trying to change their behavior. So you have, and I, I told you starting out that trust, gaining the trust of the person that you're selling to is critical, but that means different things to different people. Someone may have had a situation where the sales representative uh, didn't follow through with a commitment, or it could be the salesperson promised, over-promised something, but under-delivered, where the, the salesperson said, oh, the product does this, it does this, it does this, but in reality, it didn't do all the things that were promised. So to... Um, to really be successful, you have to ask the right questions and really listen to your customers and uncover what their needs are. And then as you're uncovering their needs, you have to be an active listener. You can't just hear what they're saying and write it down and do nothing with it. You have to be constantly processing the information as they're telling you what they're looking for because in reality, what you have to do is be a problem solver. You have to provide the, a value proposition to the customer that resonates with what the needs were that you just identified. So if they're saying, well, we have this product and it's not delivering what we want it to deliver, you, need, you can't just take that as fact. You have to keep asking more questions. Well, exactly what does that mean? What are you looking for? What's your experience been in the past? How would you change what you currently have? Meanwhile, you're listening to this and you're just thinking, all right, what do I have? What can I respond with that will answer those needs? And, and again, it's, it's this uh, constant thinking and, and processing the information, but also resonating with the customer on both an emotional level and a cognitive level. The, there are many applications of what you just discussed, and you were focusing very much on the, uh, the direct customer application of professional selling. But I had a uh, I had an entrepreneur, a startup entrepreneur, very successful, said to me once that his entire uh, job is selling. He said, not only is he selling, obviously, to the customers, he's selling to future uh, employees. Why should you come and work for me instead of working at uh, Google? Why um, he's selling to investors. He's selling to suppliers and why they should give him a line of credit. And what I heard you talking about is that applies to all of those areas. Ryan, do you have any experience with, with dealing with that selling component from multi-directional? I've often been the entrepreneur that feels like that, that every single person you're talking to in a you know early stage startup, you don't have that trust that you're just talking about building. So you've kind of, you've got to sell yourself into that. Uh, kind of have people extend the trust in the beginning before you can uh, lean on past experiences with them. And, and you know what, with that kind of approach with trust-based selling, it helps ensure future business. And that's what it's all about. You're developing relationships where the customer not only trusts you during that particular sale, but when they're thinking about new things that they need, they think of you as opposed to somebody else because it's so competitive out there. I mean, when I started out in sales, it was us. We were the only company that offered our product. Today, there's probably 30 competitors to that one product. 
And you have to stand out from the crowd. And the way you do that is to be an active listener, to let your customer do most of the talking, to identify what those needs are, and then come back with an answer. You have to be a problem solver. And you have to show the customer that you, you are the best that they're going to find and they need to come to you. And that, you know, again, that plays into the relationship building. And from there you get referrals, you know, when, uh, don't we all ask for referrals? I ask for, before I go to a doctor, I talk to people and say, who do you go to? What do you like about them? What don't you like about them? I, we go to Yelp, right? We read the reviews. It's the same thing with professional selling and personal selling that people ask and they want to know uh, who's the best out there. And that's why building trust is so critical. Yeah, I always found uh, professional selling and entrepreneurship go hand in hand. And as you know, I always encourage students studying entrepreneurship to also uh, study professional selling. And I, as I'm listening to you, there's so many parallels. Uh, Ryan and I have talked about the business model canvas, and we integrate integrity into that concept. But when you talk about creating value, that's really the essence of entrepreneurship, the commonality, understanding your customer. There, there's a definitely transition. I'm seeing more from listening to you of why it's so important to blend those two issues. You've also described as superhuman as we've been going through this. I'm, I'm sure some people listening to this are thinking, wow, I'm, I'm having to do an incredible amount. Um, are, are there any tools that you rely on, tricks of the trade, things like that to, for individuals to be able to ingest all of this information and regurgitate it in such a way that makes the product or service that they're behind? sound and work it well? There's a couple of ways to look at that. One is when you're first starting out, unfortunately, it takes practice. And it takes making mistakes in front of customers. It's one, and I recommend role playing to everybody. I role play before I do anything. When I would go teach my classes, I would role play what I was going to say. That is by far a great tool. But being in front of the customer is totally different than role playing. And then they, they ask you questions and you realize where you're weak, where you're strong. And the most successful salespeople, just like a SWOT analysis, they take the weaknesses and they turn them into strengths. That's what I used to do. I used to think I will never get caught not knowing the answer to that question. But then subsequently, there'd be a new question that I'd be asked and I wouldn't know the answer to that. But over time, I pretty much had it all down and I would not get in a situation that I couldn't get out of, right? The, the uh, one that dumbfounds everyone is when the customer says, I don't need your product, everything's perfect. And they just sit there. But over time you learn, you know, well, tell me about what the perfect product is. Have you ever had a situation that you, the product didn't meet your needs? What did you do about it? How did you feel about it? I'll, and inevitably, the customer can always remember that. But you just learn those skills over time. And you need, I mean, to be a great salesperson, you need to have knowledge of a lot. But if you really want to do well in sales, that should excite you. I mean, I loved learning about the industries that I was in, about the customers, about the products. And it didn't make it work for me, it made it fun because the way my perspective and my perception of all my sales calls were, I'm going to get you. <laughs> I'm going to get your business, whether it takes a day, a month, a year, or a couple of years. And if they said no, I, I was resilient. I would come back and ask in a different way. Or if they wouldn't see me, I'd find ways to meet them in the parking lot. You have to look at it as fun, as a challenge, as, you know, I'm going to be better. I'm going to show them that I can meet their needs. And uh, so role playing, having that knowledge, but having the right attitude, you, you just have to have, you have to look at it as fun. You have to be a, a self-starter. You know, I had a lot of reps when I was in management that I knew were not getting out of bed in the morning. They were, because really you don't clock in, you don't punch a time clock, you're out there and it's, uh, 
Um, you know, it's we just expect it as managers. And so we're not tracking you 24 seven. And um, but you, there has to be this inner motivation that just drives you to get up in the morning. And and I the most exciting times for me were when I made a sale. I mean, I would just I was it was the greatest day because I had persuaded them to change their behavior and follow my advice. And so I looked at that as what a win. And, um, but you learn as you go, you learn what your weaknesses are and you focus on those. Sometimes you might find that you don't have the right marketing materials when you're in a call. So you make sure you focus on that. Uh, Pre-call planning is a key part of it. What are you gonna say? What, What are your goals for the call? And for me, one of the reasons I was so successful is I always reviewed my calls. After I would come out, I would think, what did I do well? What didn't I do well? What can I improve on? But more importantly, what what is my goal for my next call in this account? What do I have to achieve? And when you set goals like that, you're constantly moving forward. And and I wish more of my reps would follow my advice, but but it worked for me. And uh, so... I answer your question. <laughs> you, you're touching a lot of the mentality and perspective of professional selling. Uh, from an entrepreneur who's a standalone, starting all by themselves, one of the things that they are concerned about always is prospects, prospecting and filling the pipeline. What, what advice would you give for an individual in that situation? Well, you know what? There's lots of ways to approach it. If you have money, you can buy sheets of information of customers. When I started out, what we did was we put, I mean, this is really dating me, but we would go to the yellow pages and we would just get a list of customers and start going door to door and basically cold calling. We didn't know anything about them. If I were just starting out, especially with technology, the way it is today, I would go through and accumulate as much data as I possibly could on target customers And then I would set up a a routing schedule where I would qualify my customers as A's, B's, and C's. And I would try to spend my time calling on the A's and try to get things going. But then I would always focus on that low-hanging fruit to keep me motivated because it gets depressing when you don't get sales after a while. And I would focus on that low-hanging fruit. Maybe they didn't account for a lot volume wise, but I could use them as referral sources. I could ask them, you know, if I'm going to call on this customer, can I say that you're a current customer? And for the most part, they always said yes. And they actually liked that. And and I would build on that because you definitely want to get some people using your product so that you can refer. But that's always the first question. Who's using it? Who's using the product? What do they think about it? And when I would sell a brand new product, something that we were just taking to market, it was the way to get customers interested when they heard that so-and-so was using it, currently using it, and you were providing the contact information for them. So, um, and then once, you're, once you set up this routing schedule, you start learning. You learn gee, this approach doesn't work. This approach does work. Customers are more interested in this and I'm focusing on the wrong thing. I'm asking the wrong question. But I I would take lots of notes and then review them and say, you know, what's working? How do I have to change my maybe my targeting, my routing schedule, my note-taking, my approach, uh, my presentation overall? Do I need to bring the product with me if it's small enough? Do do they always ask for marketing material? If I don't have a lot of money starting out, I may not have put the may have decided not to put the money into a lot of marketing material. But calling on customers, I find out you know what I really do need to have all of this. I need to spend more money on that. But but it I my biggest suggestion would be constantly upgrade constantly review and revise because you're not exactly, if it's a brand new product, you're not exactly sure how you'll be received. And then from there, build upon that. 
It's interesting. I feel like you're, you are touching a lot of the common mentalities for early stage entrepreneurs. And the one that's continuously popping out to me is the fail fast mentality. So get in there and, and give it your all. But once you've failed, take the lessons from it and then continue on as you go forwards from there. Absolutely. And in getting back to the trust-based selling, if you, if your folk, and again, to add to what I had just mentioned to Professor Palin, um, develop a rapport. You know, when I first started out in sales, what I would say to customers, especially the ones that eh, they were a little leery of me because I was brand new, I would say, I need to learn from people. Do you mind if I ask you all these questions? Can I follow up with you at a later date? Many of them love that. Mm -hmm. Some didn't. But I found the ones that really appreciated that and really wanted to mentor me. And it helped me solidify my relationships with them. And I became the preferred vendor because I had developed this rock solid relationship. And even if the uh, competitor would come in, I would have customers call me and say, you better get in here because we're thinking about switching. If I didn't have that relationship, they would have just switched and not told me, but they would give me a chance. And if I lost the business, then it would have been my fault because I wasn't able to keep them, but they would give me the heads up. So it's, um, you know, developing the trust is so critical. Now, another area of professional selling, the one that I enjoy the most personally, but from speaking with nascent entrepreneurs, it's the area they fear the most is closing getting the deal done. Could you talk a little bit about the closing of the sale? Yes, and I agree that uh, it is, it causes fear in the hearts of many, many, even, uh, you know, old tried and true sales reps, they hated to close. And in closing, if you, basically all you're doing in closing is you're asking for some kind of commitment. You don't always have to be asking for the sale because, once you get comfortable with the presentation and what's involved in the presentation, many times when you're selling to somebody, you realize you're not quite there yet, but you're out of time or the customer seems kind of anxious. So you at least want to leave with a commitment and you just ask, Do you, can I come back at a later date and continue our conversation? If you feel that you've gotten them to that right, to the point where they're ready to purchase, then Absolutely, ask for the business. I think too many sales reps are just afraid of being told no. But being told no is fantastic because what it's telling you is you didn't overcome all the objections. And it's telling you that somewhere along the line, you missed the cues, that the customer wasn't totally satisfied with what you were trying to deliver to them. The good news is you should learn from that Having them say no to you should not come as a surprise, because if you asked the right questions, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? If I had this, would you be interested in it? Along the way, you should be uncovering those objections and handling those objections. And that's why when you get to the end of your call, that if you don't feel you've overcome all the objections, you really shouldn't close for the business, but you should close for a follow-up appointment. And if they say no, that you can't come in for another appointment, again, you've uncovered another objection. And so before you go, the ideal situation is that you find out why, you know, and even that many sales reps are afraid to ask that because once they hear the no, they just figure that's it. I'm done. And you're never done, you know, and that's part of, you have to be resilient. You have to love the challenge. That's what sales is all about. Very often as a professor of entrepreneurship, I get asked the question, can you teach entrepreneurship? Or some people will say, you cannot teach entrepreneurship. I obviously disagree. Can professional selling be taught? Absolutely, absolutely. It, there are some people who really are born to sell. I've worked with them, I've hired them. They're, they don't need a lot of practice. They're just so great at it. There are some people that need training. Uh, a lot of times it's just learn to listen better. It's to 
develop their nonverbal skills, nonverbal communication. I mean, we, most people don't realize that our communication is about 80% nonverbal. And there are things that many people aren't aware of that they might uh, roll their eyes or they have a frown on their face or they, they speak too fast. So those are things that can be easily taught. And I, a big part of it though, is the attitude of the person. You know, the person that it makes the greatest sales rep is open to all of this, that loves the challenge and loves to learn all the new skills. But I definitely believe that it can be taught. There's hope out there for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a uh, blatant self-promotion, uh, Dr. Griffin, you've uh, created an excellent course that we have on our platform that can be found at uh, courses.profspirit.com. And I would highly recommend anyone interested in professional selling to take a look at that course. Well, and look at some of the well-known people today that started out in sales. Um, Howard Schultz, Starbucks, he started out as a salesman. I don't think anybody would believe Warren Buffett started out as a salesman or Mark uh, Cuban also. And in my experience, the CEOs of the companies that I worked for all started out in sales. From sales, they might go to marketing, but they always started out in sales. And, and I even worked with a gentleman who had a stellar career ahead of him. He started in marketing and the company told him he had to spend a year in the field before he would get promoted. So it would behoove anybody to have that kind of background if they really are motivated to get promoted, especially if they want to get into management. Companies are looking for salespeople. Before we wrap up, uh, Dr. Griffin, do you have any uh, final remarks that you would like to make? Well, I, I believe not just from a personal perspective, because I was in sales for so many years, but looking at the world around us, how we've uh, companies are now have globalized, that the economy right now is a little shaky, but salespeople are always in demand. And even I knew my own um, students at school were going into sales, and these were all marketing majors. Studies even show up to 80% of marketing majors, their first job out of school is in sales. And there's a reason for that, because there's a constant need for salespeople. There is even a greater need for really, really talented, successful salespeople. So if, if you as an individual are interested in something like that, in general, you're autonomous. You get to make your own hours. You can make an incredible amount of money and you, the sky's the limit. I mean, you start there and you can generally go in any direction that you want to go in or just use it in your personal life. But I would recommend to anybody to really understand selling well, you've made some extremely valuable and pertinent uh, observations. We greatly appreciate you spending the time to speak with us. Well, uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you very much for coming today. I think a lot of what you've said today is really applicable to the audience that we're targeting. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thanks for listening to our favorite tools for entrepreneurs with Professor Gary Palin and Ryan Budden. We hope you enjoyed this deep dive into topics that assist with the launch and growth of your entrepreneurial venture. As always, you can head over to profspirit.com to check out more resources and courses designed for you, the entrepreneur. Also, please follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube to get the most up-to-date information as it is released.